When you invented the iPod, where did you think it would lead in your wildest dreams? Did you see a phone and a tablet and a watch and a whole new ecosystem? Uh, absolutely not. Where we were coming off of and where I was coming off of is like 10 years of failure from general magic and all kinds of personal handheld devices, which were just, the only thing that was successful was Palm at the time. So a decade of that, and then, you know, Apple called and said, we have iTunes. What, you know, we want to make an Apple version because we're trying to hook up to MP3 players, right? And so that's how it all came, came about. Now, they've just launched their biggest improvement to the Mac in yeah. years. How good is it? It's and, great. And how does it change the direction for the Mac going forward? I, it's a great question, and if you think about it, the Mac has been basically stuck in whatever Intel could deliver. The Mac kind of worked around it. Now you're going to see incredible innovation. And you've already seen it in just a year from the first Mac um, with an M1, now M1 Pro and M1 Max. There's going to be dramatic changes because they can change so many things in the hardware so you can put all kinds of other features on that you've never seen before. So I'm really excited. I have even bought one within minutes after it was announced. Do you buy everything within minutes? Or no. Just that? <laughs> no. And even from Apple, I don't buy everything. Yeah. That one I did. So look, sure. uh, Apple is moving away from Intel chips dramatically and... Done. It's done. done. It's over. For, forever. Permanently. Never going to go back. Not going to go back. What does that mean for a new cycle of innovation? Is so much more possible because that's in-house? Well, if, yeah, absolutely. Because Apple's schedules were dictated when Intel could release those processors. So all the Macs and everything would have to be in lockstep with Intel. The other one was they had to put in hundreds of extra dollars into a Mac for all the margins they had to pay Intel. So when you have to pay Intel $200, $300, $400 per Mac, what does that mean? Now they can take that money and either drop the prices or innovate and put more things into the max. Meantime, this supply chain crunch is impacting everyone, and even Apple. Yep. Even Apple. Absolutely. They might have to slash production of 10 million iPhones that had been planned. Employees, we just reported employees say this is the bleakest they've ever seen in terms of wait times. How bad is this? Well, it's not good. But you have to remember, Apple's been on allocation for all kinds of things over the years. iPod was on allocation for, for two, three years for sales because we couldn't get enough things. But if you look at it, really, Apple has some of the strongest silicon contracts and supply contracts in the world. And so maybe the other ones didn't, you know, other companies trying to get silicon can't get what they need. But a Apple has priority allocation. So if there is silicon to be, to be uh, made, Apple's going to get it because they're pretty strict on how okay. they work with their suppliers. Now, as innovative as Apple has been, there are still those who complain that Apple hasn't innovated <laughs> as much as it did under Steve Jobs. Sure, and I'm curious sure. how you respond to that. Apple is a much bigger place. I still think it's innovating. I don't think just because you want to see a new hardware platform or a new thing, it's, that's not the only place where you innovate. You innovate all kinds of software and services like we're seeing. So that's great. That's wonderful. We'll see new hardware from time to time. Look at the new M1 Max. Those are absolutely innovation. They might not seem like a whole new product category, but it's going to grow market share tremendously for pros and everything else and their margins as well. People want a whole new product category, though. They, they always do. When? And what will it be? Is I it don't know. Be Ask them. AR glasses? A car? Do you think those are things that Apple should be working on that we'll see eventually? It's one person's opinion. <laughs> I think, you know, we've looked at AR stuff for a long time, and it's all down to the display technology for AR. Hopefully Apple has something. I think they might. Um, one of our companies at Future Shape has helped Apple with the, all the mini LED um, displays inside the, the Macs. And then the next one really is about, you know, the car. Well, we've heard about, you know, change of leadership three, four, five times. So. Maybe there's something there, maybe there's not. I think it's a great space to go in, mobility in general. Um, but, we'll, you know, time will tell. What's your expectation for sort of the next chapter of Apple? You know, it's obviously, it's been 10 years since Tim Cook took over as CEO. Great 10 and, years. A, a, and Incredible. 10 more years ahead, maybe. What's going to be the next chapter? I, I think what you're going to see is there's going to just be more software and services on the platforms they have. We'll probably see one more, probably one more big hardware new product category, probably not two. 
And you'll see a lot more accessories, you know, like you're seeing the AirPods and things of that nature, which are huge product lines. Those are Fortune, those can be Fortune 500 companies in and of themselves. So I, maybe you're not gonna see tremendous stuff like an iPod, an iPhone, iPad, all those kinds of things coming, but there's so much more you can build on around the ecosystem of Apple. So I think you gotta really look at software and services as where Apple will be headed. What do you think about the metaverse? Is this where everyone is heading? Should, is that a good thing? I've heard about metaverse <laughs> since in 1988 when we were doing VR glasses back in the day. So I've heard that stuff come up and down and up and down and we see, you know, we see VR happening and then it's not happening. So I'm, I'm still skeptical that it's gonna be a big thing. I think it's gonna be big in corporate and industrial because there's gonna be very specific focused things. But to get that emotional aspect for the consumers and wanna be in it all the time, right. That's tougher. And if see. it's going to be a big thing, do you think it will be a dystopian thing or a place that we actually will thrive? Look, we didn't want the <laughs> we didn't want the smartphone to become, you know, the refrigerator for all this dystopia that we see with social media. I hope it doesn't happen there as well. We've learned a lot of what the unintended consequences of these devices. So let's just hope that you know, this is not going to come with that. Um, we're seeing dystopia a little bit with, you know, self-driving cars that we have to m maintain and monitor. So I think we're going we're gonna to have to be really careful about, as we move forward, thinking about the societal impacts. Do you think that comes down to regulation, or is that choices that executives are making at these companies? Where, you know, who... It's who always to down to the executives. It's always down to the executives. I saw when we were, you know, selecting the types of content we were going to put on the iTunes music store and video store. You know, there was a very clear discussion about, well, why don't we sell porn? Why doesn't Apple sell porn? It's very profitable. People digest it all day long. And Steve got up and said, is this the kind of society we want to live in? Is this what we want to have our kids use as products? And he said, absolutely not. Yes, it can make money, but no, that's not the right thing. So you have to, it goes down to the executive teams and the boards of these companies to make sure they're setting and self-regulating. Because the government is not going to be able to regulate. And so when you see this dystopian world coming from social media, they must regulate themselves. And I don't want to hear this double talk that we're seeing coming out of Facebook and these other companies. Right. It's just... I'm sorry, total How, Do you have confidence in Mark Zuckerberg that, that he'll do that? Next question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's move on to another tech giant, which is Google. You, of course, sold Nest to Google. Yeah. Obviously, you know, they've come out with this new Pixel phone. Um, some people are saying this could be their first real smartphone hit. You think? I hope so. <laughs> they've been trying. They've been trying for years. I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, in the Android world, there's a lot of different ways of selling, selling those products, and there's a real tough competition. Um, so maybe it'll work, but it requires more than just hardware. It requires all the services. It requires all the customer support, all the retail, all of those things. And, you know, I just haven't, it takes more than a product. And, a, and the customer journey at Google is mostly software driven and it's log on and, you know, and, and search. So we'll see if they get it right. Given that they bought Nest, what do you think about their decarbonization plans and what Google and frankly Apple are doing to try to minimize the impact they have the, on the environment? I think it's, I think it's wonderful. We have, to, we have to do every single thing we possibly can um, around our operations of, of, of companies and how we, how we decarbonize there, but we also have to decarbonize around the products and the supply chain. So when we look at you know, the products, where are, the, what's, where are they being manufactured? Where are those suppliers and that whole supply chain? And are they decarbonizing? So it's great to have the headquarters do it, but you need the whole chain to do it. And, and I, I hope we're going to hear much more from these large companies about that um, and how they're pushing their suppliers to make sure they're doing more than just you know, labor and, and, and watching those kinds of issues. Amazon just came out with a smart th thermostat. That is a relatively low price point. Sure. You think it's any good? <laughs> I, Honeywell is involved, so mm. I, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I know, you don't miss words. Well, okay. I, I have some, uh, you know, a bone to pick with them still. Well, what about the sort of the the connecting of our homes? You know, they've also, you know, rolled out this indoor flying drone and a home robot. Do we need all that? Is that exciting to you, or is that terrifying? I, there's a lot of things you can make. Doesn't mean you should make them. Mm. So I think you have to really look at what you're trying to do, and. To me, less is more, and that was always about Steve. What are you going to say no to? And so if they want to put more things in, you know, they tried microwaves. They've tried all kinds of other clocks with it, all kinds of other things. 
they need to, I think they need to focus and say these are the things that really matter. When you do this kind of throw the spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks, it doesn't really work from a marketing point of view and customers don't get locked in. So should Amazon have said no to the robot? No to the ro drone? I don't know enough about the robot. I haven't seen it. The drone, yeah, I'm just like, come on, really? That's interesting. I mean, that's interesting given that, you know, drop cam, Nest drop cam. Yeah, 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 yeah. Know, but it's a flying, business, it's a right. flying, it's a flying, it's a flying camera. Maybe it'll be successful. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't tried it. I haven't seen it. Um, we'll see. I don't so, know. So talk to us about your work at, at Future Shape. I know you're really interested in sustainability and there's yeah. this big question of how will all of these products ultimately be sustainable? Will they be? sustainable what's the what's the big innovation that you're most excited about well for me I'm seeing you know in a lot of cases because we're doing a lot of investment we have 200 uh, companies around the world that we're directly invested in we're taking a lot of technology and bringing it to bear in various developing countries whether that's Southeast Asia or Latin America and helping small and um, small businesses medium-sized businesses being able to get access to this technology so that they're able to raise themselves up and do it in a sustainable way. So a lot of that stuff we're doing is to try to help these communities and these individual proprietors, not just big businesses. So when we look at stuff, we're looking at aquaculture and agri agriculture and ag tech. We're looking at fintech for these small and medium businesses. Um, we're looking at new materials. Um, all, we're, we're looking across the board, and then we also do the more traditional stuff, which would be bio, synbio, um, drugs, drug platforms. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that we're working on, and um, you know, uh, uh, I'm really excited about one company called Menlo Micro. We, if you remember the trans, uh, the, the transistor, it moved from the vacuum tube to the transistor. We're going to actually replace all of these energy inefficient relays and kinds of things in the RF, 5G world, EV world, mm -hmm. and we have a new micro-mechanical switch that's absolutely as important as the transistor. And, you know, I know you're spending most of your time living outside the United States, and I'm curious with this global perspective on Silicon Valley, what do you see? Is Silicon Valley doing right by the world or not? I think Silicon Valley needs to invest more in these climate Mm -hmm. uh, a change um, directed businesses. We're still seeing too much on buy now, pay later. We're mm -hmm. seeing too much on social. Mm -hmm. And where we're investing and where we're finding stuff is not in Silicon Valley for the most part. We're finding it all over the country, all over the US, but we're also finding it in Europe. We're finding it in Southeast Asia, India. So I'm really bullish in seeing that this Industrial Revolution 2.0 is happening and it's happening everywhere. And there's many companies outside of Silicon Valley doing it, because it's not going to just come from Silicon Valley. We need to do it everywhere and make sure it's local for the communities and what they need in those countries.